In keeping with the Baratheon doctrine of heavy armor, our Lord Lightbringer's kit includes a scale shirt and a plate helm, making them more capable than most archery units of withstanding direct assault. The extra protection aids in wielding their most potent weapon, fire. Lightbringer arrows are dipped in oil and ignited seconds before firing. The oil is sticky, and while it burns out quickly, it can easily set materials ablaze on impact. Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian, and in this video we're going to be talking about the Relore Lightbringers. It is still the summer of Stannis uh, in terms of releases, so we've got another Stannis Baratheon loyalty unit to talk about. The Relore Lightbringers, they don't have a banner bearer, so they come with four unique sculpts that comprise the 12 body uh, combat infantry unit, and they come in at seven points with that Stannis Baratheon loyalty, so they can't be used by anything Renly, which is a super shame because they are an amazing ranged unit. So turning focus to the front of their card where all their stats are located, we see that we've got a speed 5 unit with a defense save of 4 plus and a morale save of, or morale stat, sorry, of 6 plus. They have the fire arrows ranged attack that hits on threes or better with a 764 decay stat at long range. They also have a melee attack called, called daggers and it hits on fives or better with a 543 decay, decay rate. Looking over to their abilities, we see that the fire arrows have the ability Vicious baked into them, so they'll get minus two to panic tests whenever uh, they cause one on the unit they're attacking. And then if the defender fails their panic test, you target one other enemy unit in short range of that unit, and they suffer one panic test with minus two to their roll. So the Relore Lightbringers are a premium unit. Seven points is pretty elite, and they have the stats to kind of kick around with that too. The, having the 4 plus defense save and the 6 plus morale makes them a fairly survivable unit. And those stats are attached to a ranged unit, which you probably don't really care too much about having a decent armor save or defense save on the uh, ranged units because your hope is that they don't get locked up in combat very often. But it does mean that if they do or if they, they're getting hit by some other ability, they've got a decent chance to survive. With the seven points, you get a pretty valuable unit in terms of their output. I think in this, uh, in the game in general, the scenarios really enjoy, or they really uh, reward someone who brings a ranged unit. I think that a lot of lists are going to try and fold some in there because they can hold their, you can go pretty much as wide as you want to and hold an objective and still have a unit affect the table. And with these guys being long range and not just having a, a good attack stat at six or seven six and then four for the last one, but that's no big deal. Um, they hit on threes, so they're pretty accurate. But then on top of that, they've got vicious, so they're likely to cause some wounds to go through on panic, and then they'll echo another one within short range. Now, it might be hard for you to try and always make this happen. Uh, it, your opponent can kind of position around it so that the Relore Lightbringers don't really uh, kind of just destroy all of their units. But d if the scenario dictates or the situation dictates that you need to be uh, cl you need to have a couple of your opponent's units close together, or your opponent needs to have them close together, right? If they're in a multi-engagement, because they're going into a really solid unit, which Baratheons have quite a bit of, uh, you're likely to get some real big value out of these guys, and then on top of that, if you're doing Relore stuff, that'll help you out too. So before we get into the commander synergies, I did want to talk about one of the units that I kind of alluded to in my last statement here, and that's going to be the Relore Faithful. So they have the ability Heart of Fire, which is a faith-based mechanic, where whenever they pass a morale, they end up gaining a faith token that they can use for several abilities. So the reason why this is really cool with the Relore Lightbringers is that you can get the Relore Faithful engaged with your opponent, and they can fight and use their their tokens to do whatever it is they want to do. They can get precision and vicious on an attack. They can uh, cause an automatic three hits if they want to. And then they also have the ability to uh, cause a, a relore unit to uh, make an attack action outside of their activation within long range when this unit is destroyed. So the cool things about this is 
there's there's just a, a bunch of layers, I guess, to how cool this is when it works. Is uh, you get engaged with your opponent because you're fighting, you're doing what you're trying to do. So the Relord Lightbringers kind of saunter up and then shoot the unit that is engaged with the Faithful. Then they'll they'll do some damage, maybe cause another panic check within short range. But the big thing is that they're going to be causing a panic check on the Relore Faithful, and with them having a 4-plus morale, they're likely to pass it, so you end up getting a Faith token ready and rare to go. Uh, this essentially means you can always have the ability to uh, get the Faith tokens on this unit, and that gets more valuable as they get closer to, to being removed from the table, because as soon as they do, as long as you've got that Faith token... You can allow those Relore Lightbringers to shoot again, and it might just be enough to take out the unit that takes them out. So there's a lot of things your opponent has to think about when you've got this kind of small little faith engine going. And I think they pair really well together, and uh, it, it's going to be something that uh, as soon as you see it on the table, I think you'll probably appreciate it more than seeing it on paper. But it can be pretty, uh, pretty nasty once you start getting a lot of these abilities just kind of when you want them. So the commander I want to talk about within this uh, this unit discussion is going to be one we haven't mentioned yet in any of the Baratheon videos. We're kind of running out of space with these Stannis characters, though. And that's going to be Davos Seaworth, the hero of Blackwater. So as an attachment, he brings the ability outflank so you can hold the unit off the table and then bring them in whenever you claim the maneuver zone and do a replacement effect for that. He also has the ability Pathfinder so they ignore dangerous, hindering, and rough keywords. So that last bit there isn't really a big deal for the archers. I mean, you can probably put them into some neat places uh, with terrain kind of protecting them and then be able to get out of it if you are maneuvering around the table a bit. But honestly, I don't think the Relore Lightbringers are going to be moving a ton. But we'll get to that a little bit with his cards. Outflank is a weird rule for this unit. Of course, you're not going to be getting the unit up the table and ready to shoot on turn one unless your opponent's being really loose with how they're doing things or they're trying to bait you into attacking them so that they can do something with a tactics card so it's rough because you don't want to have your commander off the table right away because there's every almost every single scenario if i'm not mistaken allows you to score more points by having your commander somewhere on that table also there are a lot of ways to deny you from uh, being able to do anything with this zone, like I'm thinking about those Targaryen field controls and things like that. So I think it's risky, but if you're playing against the right opponent or the right faction, then I think you can hold this unit off the table, and it'll give you the chance to get another negative to their uh, morale and then essentially give them sundering when they're shooting. So it's it's a... It's an ability that you could use from time to time, but it's not something that I think I would take full advantage of. So we lose a little bit of synergy with Davos and kind of feeling like it's more situational. But I think no matter who who you put uh, Davos in, in terms of the unit, uh, it's going to be uh, an iffy one if you're going to use Outflank or not. So Davos does have a couple cards that end up synergizing with the Lightbringers pretty well, and the first one's going to be Flea Bottom Tricks. So you end up losing Final Strike from this, or from the, the base tactics deck to get this card, and it isn't a feel-good thing because you want to be able to generate a lot of extra hits and wounds and do more damage outside of your normal activations, but the Relore stuff is usually quite aggressive, and if we're kind of building towards that with that small Relore Lightbringer faithful engine, I don't think you're going to miss it a whole lot. But the cool thing about Flea Bottom Tricks is that you just trigger this after an enemy completes a melee attack, then you target one other or one friendly combat unit that wasn't the defender, and then they can perform a maneuver action. If it targets Davos's unit, they can pivot and then perform one march instead. And this is one of the big reasons why I want Davos in the Lightbringers unit, because my opponent can just sit there, and, or I can project a unit forward, like say I'm doing something like the Queensmen or something like that. They go forward, plant their feet in the ground, my opponent crashes into them because they need to start doing work to them, and then I just get to trigger this card because they've been attacked, and then my Relore Lightbringers are now in a position to be able to shoot whatever it is they want to on the table because they've just got this huge threat projection up the table, you know, another 10 inches, which gives you another 14 inch threat. So it's uh, it's pretty nasty being able to do something like this, and one of the big reasons why I have Davos in that unit. 
The next card we have is Everything. So this triggers at the start of any turn and you can target a friendly infantry unit. That unit suffers three wounds and then you target one other friendly infantry unit anywhere on the table. And they restore that many wounds. And as well, if they don't have an attachment, you can take, uh, as one of those restored wounds, replace a previously destroyed attachment into that unit. So it doesn't have to be the one that originally came from that unit. Of course it wouldn't, because if it was, they'd be dead. But I think in the 2021 version of the game, attachments gain a lot more value because we're kind of not... We're a little de-incentivized to build three NCU lists, and I think Baratheons, especially these were lore focused ones, are probably not going to be utilizing that ever, really. So uh, whenever you lose a good attachment, especially with how uh, frequent or how common uh, expert duelists are going to be, uh, this just allows you to get that points investment back for the very low rate of three wounds to that unit. And if this is just going to be that uh, Relore Lightbringer unit, Chances are they're not taking a lot of heat during the game in general, and you can just uh, use them as kind of like a repository to make sure that you're keeping your other units up and effective for combat. So Davos also brings fealty to the crown, and this is great for the Relore Lightbringers because they're hopefully just going to be creating two panic checks every time they uh, lose some arrows. So you'll be able to get the chance to see if they see if that unit that they're shooting at loses a bunch of wounds and then use that to restore some elsewhere. But this triggers when an enemy fails a panic test, so you get to see what the results are, of course, because you have to see if they fail it. You target one friendly unit in long range, and then for each wound that the enemy suffered from this test, you restore one wound to that unit up to three. If you control the crown, you end up restoring an additional one. So with the ability to just cause a bunch of panic checks and having Vicious out there, and likely having things like Intimidating Presence to up the amount of wounds someone would end up taking from a panic test, Fealty to the Crown is going to be a... It's going to give the Relore Lightbringers another opportunity to be a support role for the rest of your army because you're going to be able to trigger this quite frequently. So it's not something that you're worried... You don't have to sit there and hold it in your hand until you get that perfect one because the perfect one is likely to come up a lot quicker so you can just kind of burn through this and kind of keep those units uh, that are in the mix in the front lines really full so that your Relore Lightbringers really aren't ever really under threat from your opponent's melee units. Davos's final card, Parlay, is an interesting one. Uh, it essentially just me says that whenever your opponent activates a unit, you can instead say that unit doesn't perform any... Well, sorry, other way around. So when your unit activates... You just say, this unit that I have is not going to perform any actions, and then you target one enemy unit within short range, and then they cannot perform any actions and are considered to have been activated. If this does target Davos's unit, you can have uh, both units restore two wounds. So this could be something fun with uh, making sure that your opponent doesn't get into the Lightbringers if they happen to break through the front lines. You can say Davos's unit isn't going to go, and then I'm also going to say your unit can't go, and then you get, you're get safe for a turn at least, and that might let you get a little bit more flexible and get things into position to be able to deal with the threats that are coming at the Lightbringers. Uh, it also is decent for when you've got something like Baratheon Wardens that are low on wounds, kind of camping out on an objective, and then you can just say, well, I'm not going to let you activate the unit that's near them, so you can't come and wipe them off, so I've at least got another turn where this unit's going to stay on this objective and gain me points. So... Parlay's a neat one, and I don't think I would ever do something like stop the Lightbringers from activating since they have so much projection, but there are definitely points where it can come up. I think Parlay is a really neat card and uh, gives Davos uh, some interesting control play that the Baratheon players aren't used to seeing, especially on that Stannis side. So flipping over to attachments that synergize well with this unit, it, this is basically going to be the Davos Seaworth show because as an attachment he's also good and could be one of the reasons why you might not want him as your commander because for one point you end up getting True Conviction, which just says if this is a Baratheon unit, each time it attacks an enemy with more remaining ranks, it can reroll any of the attack dice. And that works for melee or ranged. Which, for the Lightbringers, doesn't seem like a really big deal because they're a ranged unit and you're hoping that they're not losing wounds. But Davos Seaworth also brings the order Supply Aid that triggers at the start of a friendly turn 
you can have this unit suffer up to three wounds and then restore one plus that many wounds to another unit within long range. So essentially what you can do here is make sure that your front lines are surviving well and not losing a lot of, uh, well, that the, the, the wounds that you're losing are getting replenished from the the Lightbringer unit because when they lose a rank, it's not a big deal. They're still shooting six dice and that will typically get you triggering out true conviction. There's definitely diminishing returns because as the game goes on, your opponent's less likely to have more ranks. But I think it's just a nice thing to have in your back pocket on the Lightbringers to be able to keep some of those more tough units uh, well supplied with bodies, especially if we're looking at something like the Queensmen, because then you can start making sure that they're always getting the two cards that they're pulling uh, because they're going to be in the game longer, right? So I think that Davos Seaworth isn't like the 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 windmill slam command or attachment that you end up putting in this unit, but I can definitely see you getting a lot of value out of him for just that one point in the unit. Some other great attachments that probably don't go in this unit, but work really well with it when they're in other units, are going to be things like Vargo Hote. So for two points, he's he's pretty nasty. He ends up getting three different things he attaches to the unit. And the first one's going to be Sadistic Mutilation. So after this unit completes a melee attack, you can expend a weakened token from the defender. And if you do, you destroy one infantry attachment in that unit. So it's kind of a, a much more assured uh, expert duelist. You have to have that weakened token on there, but we have plenty of ways to do that. The, he also gives the unit Vicious, just base. And then he has the ability Weaken Resolve, where each time an enemy engaged with this unit fails a panic test, they become weakened. So that ends up turning on the Sadistic Mutilation. So he's kind of like his own little engine here. Now if we reflect back on the units that work well with the Lightbringers, if we put him in a unit of Relore Lightbringers, there's a little bit of like uh, overlap giving them Vicious. Maybe something in like Queensmen even would be good for him. But uh, you can have them engaged with the unit, shoot in with the uh, Lightbringers, then they're likely to fail a panic test. Hopefully they're failing that panic test, right? Because you're targeting low morale units, and the Vicious is going to help you trigger that. And that will cause them to get a weakened token on them, so that when you activate that unit to attack, you can use Sadistic Mutilation to get through and destroy that attachment. Now you don't have to worry about it anymore. So it's more like, you know, dicey engine stuff with the R'hllor Faithful, and like I said, you can do this with Queensmen or any other unit that you might think has a, a better chance of uh, being able to support someone with, like Vargo, or at least take full advantage of someone like Vargo, but he is definitely uh, dangerous because you don't have to worry about rolling that 3-plus to destroy attachments, and he just makes the unit really gross anyways, because even if you're not uh, destroying attachments in that unit, you're at least giving them weaken all the time because you're you have the vicious, the lightbringers have vicious, so you can just kind of do whatever you can activate whatever unit you want to to be able to get what you need out of it, and it gets uh, this guy just gets really disgusting and has a lot of utility and synergy with being able to uh, uh, work with a unit that's going to be shooting into their combat so that they can trigger these panic tests when these ones uh, could get a little bit of benefit from them. Keeping in with the neutrals and the same thing about like not putting units in the R'hllor Lightbringers but bringing attachments that synergize with them outside of the Lightbringers is going to be Ramsey Snow and Theon Greyjoy or Reek, I believe is what his attachment is called. No, it's, it's Theon Greyjoy, just Reek in general, like that's his little thingy under there. But anyways, uh, Ramsey Snow, he, he lets the unit become a Bolton unit, which isn't really that big of a deal uh, unless maybe you're running a a Roos led list with Lightbringers in it, which could actually be pretty cool now that I think about it. But um, we have the ability Fueled by Slaughter, and that just states that after this unit completes a melee attack, if the defender suffered any wounds, this unit restores one wound plus one additional wound for uh, each of the defender's destroyed ranks. This is just a good ability in Bolt or in uh, Baratheons in general, because you want to make sure you're focusing on some of this healing, and with Stannis, you don't really get as much access to it as Renly does. So this is just a way to make sure that one of your hard tanky units is staying nice and full um, as they're destroying things. Ramsey also brings the ability Intimidating Presence. So enemies engaged with this unit suffer neg one to morale test rolls and plus one wound from failing panic tests. So this is going to be another folding into that uh, deal with uh, if you're engaged with the enemy. 
and your opponent, and you shoot into them with the Lightbringers and Ramsey Snow's in that engagement, they're going to have the 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 one the the fail the the minus two from vicious and then minus one from this and then if they end up failing that one they're they're taking an additional wound from it so it's just another way to try and broadcast more of that damage through panic which might be throwing some people off because they're thinking that panic isn't that big of a deal this edition but it is it's quite a big deal when we look at Fion Greyjoy he just has the order set an example that triggers at the start of any turn you can target all enemies within short range and they become panicked you roll a die and on a six you destroy theon so you've got like a a 16 percent chance that theon will only get to do this once but you know hopefully that isn't something that happens to you but being able to get panic tokens on everything within this short range bubble is going to be really good for those light bringers as well because if there are multiple units within short range those panic tests with the uh, with the Relore Lightbringer's ranged attack are likely to do more or actually make it so that your opponent's more likely to fail with all those panic tokens. So I think that Theon and Ramsey, although a hefty points investment on already the investment of the unit that they go into and the Lightbringer's, uh, I think they can do quite a bit of work and churn out a lot of damage through panic checks that your opponent might not be able to see right away when they look at them. The final thing I want to talk about as a synergy with the Lightbringers is going to be an NCU, and we're looking at Walder Frey for this one. So the late Walder Frey ability states that he you can only activate Walder if you have no other units to activate this round, and then each time Walder claims a zone, you can replace that zone's effect with any effect from any zone. And if you happen to claim the crown, you can replace that effect with one enemy becomes weakened, one friendly unit restores two wounds, and at the start of the next round, you become the first player. So the the big reason why I like Walder Frey when we're looking at the Lightbringers is that typically with the Baratheon list, or like the way that I'm kind of pointing this build with a lot of these expensive units and attachments, is that you're going to have a pretty small list, but you'll still be able to broadcast a lot of damage through all these multiple panic checks and, and attacks you can take. So that means that you're going to be able to activate Walder Frey earlier in the in the, the turn, and that might mean you actually get to take the crown when you want it to be that first player next turn and get those attacks going again. The other cool thing about Walder is if you're not getting the the cool effect from the crown because you are a Baratheon player and you will want to be taking that crown zone earlier, is that regardless of what happens on that NCU board, you can always get another attack out of the Lightbringer. So for four points, at the very bare minimum, you're getting an extra attack from Lightbringers each turn, and that's guaranteed. There's n other than your opponent like turning off an NCU or trying to stop that ability somehow, there's not much that's going to stop you from doing that. And I think when you've got a smaller list, like the one that will probably get, that you'll probably build based off of a lot of these suggestions or synergies, uh, getting that guaranteed extra attack is pretty valuable. So even if you're not doing the thing where you're getting the uh, the the free first player. You know, you're, you're kind of swiping it out from someone. Uh, it's still going to be a pretty valuable thing to have Walder in your list. So overall, the Relore Lightbringers are quite a devastating unit. When you're thinking about scenario play, you always want to make sure you're bringing something that can sit on some of these backfield objectives and either be so uh, non-committal that you don't really care that they're sitting back there doing nothing, something like a melee unit that's just really cheap or a solo that's really cheap, that you can just throw on a backfield objective because it's scoring you points and that's what matters for winning the game, right? But uh, you can also do things like put some of these really effective ranged units on these backfield objectives so that they can still be affecting the game. And with the Relore Lightbringers having already, already hitting accurately, throwing a lot of dice, and having Vicious on top of that, they're able they're able to also trigger another panic test if there's something clumped up around them. So for seven points, you get a really effective unit that is typically always going to be active in the game, regardless of, you know, what's going on in the backfield of the table. And you can also bring a lot of things to help project that threat or make it uh, 
you know, more, more frequent at least, so that you're really jamming a lot of these attacks and panic checks. So when I think about how many of these I wanted to get for myself, at first I had only gotten one unit because I, you know, I was thinking about it from this Walder Frey synergy of being able to just always get extra attacks out of them. And I definitely think that some of my more effective lists or lists that are more attractive to me really only have one unit of the Relore Lightbringers in there because I am pointing towards trying to get as many attacks out of that unit as possible. That means I've got Walder, that means I've got the Relore Faithful so they can start uh, triggering the extra attack from them based off Faith tokens when they end up getting destroyed. But I ended up screwing around just for, for, for kicks on making what I like to, what I'd probably like to call now like a 1.6 legacy list, where I had two NCUs and five combat activations. Two of them were Relore Lightbringers, and the rest was just a bunch of like five point dorks. There might have been a Queensmen unit in there, and then I took some NC. The the two NCUs were cheap ones as well, and. Uh, there wasn't much flavor in terms of like getting some of those attachments to increase effectiveness. Now that there could be like the meta gaming, the meta game where you're not putting attachments in your army because you want to dodge expert duelist. So when I did that, I was still able to get quite a few attacks out of this unit. I wasn't able to do any of the cool, cute synergies with the Relore Faithful or anything like that, but still being able to have Walder in there. Getting at least three or four attacks out of the Relore Lightbringers was still pretty cool. So I did end up getting a second unit, um, and I'm kind of happy I did just because the models are cool and they'll definitely look good to paint. But I think that you could really skate by with only getting one of these and be pretty happy with how they perform, especially if you're kind of doing things like trying to make sure you get the most out of their attacks alongside those Relore Faithful. So that, I think, does it for the new Baratheon releases. So I look forward to seeing some more Renly stuff because I think now the the scales have definitely tipped in Stannis's favor, and it, which is interesting at least because I think a lot of the Stannis players really didn't appreciate the R'hllor Faithful when they were the only unit available to um, the Stannis loyalty side, whereas the uh, Renly side got a lot of use out of the Rose Knights right away. So it felt almost like Stannis didn't have the same kind of loyalty representation as Renly at the time. But now I think that Stannis definitely has enough of his own loyalty units to really like make you feel like you're, you know, you're able to have some more control in how you build your lists and start being able to work a lot of these synergies. And I hope we just get that kind of thing going on with Renly as well, because the Rose Knights, they, they have synergy within Renly's own, like, kind of mechanics with all the healing, but uh, I definitely would like to see a little bit more of the Renly uh, loyalty system, or at least the flavor of the Renly loyalty, kind of come to fruition in the game like the Stannis one has with just these three releases. So thanks for sticking with me on this one. Uh, I know it was a, maybe a little, well, it's not that much longer than the other ones, but it's still pretty long, I feel like these get... Um, I think I had a, a little bit of a break for a while, but I'm back at it, and I think I've only got one or two more things to talk about for these new releases, and then we can kind of start getting back to some of these commander talks and maybe some other, like, hot topic issues. Um, I'm just looking forward to just continuing to diversify the channel and really kind of um, bring in a lot of different uh, A Song of Ice and Fire discussion points. I think that... Um, the new releases like this I really enjoy talking about, but I'd be interested to see if people, or interested to hear if people would also like these kind of things for legacy units, or the units that already existed that have kind of ported into uh, 2021. I don't think there's a whole lot of shift in how they really work, um, you know, if you were a 1.6 player, but I definitely can see that there are a lot of new people coming to the game and there might be value in that so definitely leave me a comment in the section below if those are things that you're interested in or just some other things that you might be interested in seeing outside of just these unit focused discussions and then my old uh, commander focused discussions where we built lists again thanks for watching and uh, i look forward to seeing you in the next video